Okay, welcome everyone to the seminar series from Shift to Rail to Europe's Rail and the last seminar about the digital automatic coupler. Uh, my name is Anna Björkman and this is uh, Anders Ekmark. Hello. Uh, both working at Lindholmen Science Park and we will be moderating this seminar. Last week we talked about Europe's Rail and what will be done there. Um, and Constance Banholzer from ÖBB talked about the work that will be performed in uh, the digital uh, freight train. And uh, Jan Bergstrand from uh, Trafikverket uh, talked about why we need the seamless operations in Europe and what can be done there. And Björn Bryne talked about uh, what the, uh, Norway will do in Europe's rail. So today we will focus on the digital automatic coupler that's already been mentioned as a, something that we looked into in uh, shift to rail and also a technical enabler for the digital freight train. And uh, uh, the technology was tested in uh, shift to rail and uh, as the actors saw a big potential in the, the digital automatic coupler shortened as DAC, uh, the European DAC delivery program, shortened as EDDP, was uh, started in order to focus on this technology and uh, look into uh, what are the potentials with the technology and how can we introduce the DAC in Europe. And this is the agenda of today. Uh, we will listen to uh, Jens Engelmann from Railable talking about the possibilities with DAC and the European DAC delivery program. And then I will introduce uh, what we are doing regarding tests and demonstrations. And Fabian Waldseck from Deutsche Bahn will talk about the DAC for EU. And Johan Orman uh, will, from Delne will uh, tell us a bit about uh, the manufacturer's perspective and the Swedish winter tests. And then Björn Brine and Anders Ekmark uh, will discuss uh, how the digital automatic coupler can be introduced in Sweden and Norway. And then at 10, we will have a Q&A session. But uh, we encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A continuously during the seminar and we will try to uh, answer the questions after each presentation, but there will also be more time for questions in the end. And note that the seminar ends at uh, 10.15 and that the workshop that was planned afterwards is cancelled. Uh, with that introduction, I will hand over to Jens Engelmann from Railable. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Just a sound check. Yes. Yes, perfect. Good morning to Gothenburg to go. Good morning to all in Europe. Here's Jens. Hello, yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Anna. Perfect as always. And Anders, good morning. Um, I am one of the two program managers of this famous EDDP, the European DAC Delivery Program, which is a huge and brave name, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> and many of you are participating in it. And um, <clears throat> I will not talk to you about the program management and the structure and so on, because you heard about Europe's Rail, you heard about Shift to Rail, you know that this program is located within Shift to Rail, <clears throat> has been located, is now within Europe's Rail, and we have more or less 70 organizations all over Europe um, to participate in this program with something like 270, 300 participants. Many of them are volunteers uh, participating at the um, transformation of the European um, rail freight business. The best regards from the from my co or main program manager, Mark Tupal, Gökcini, who is from Austrian Railways, ÖBB. And um, let's start right away because you asked about possibilities with digital automatic coupling. And the question behind is why do we do that at all? Yeah. And um, of course, in such a good video story, we always share some slides, shall we, Anna? I will do. And I hope that you can see a full screen now. Can you see? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. And then I hope that also the video check from yesterday will <coughs> work because I will also have a two minutes video for you. Um, the most important thing is here, at least at the, at the front page, you are here um, from the EDTP perspective, but there is also a project called Daccelerate, where you see the logo left on top. 
which is funding a great part of the activities we are doing here currently. So also um, this video broadcast from our side. Into the content, challenges of rail freight, depending on how many of you are really um, deeply involved into rail freight, but the issues we have is we don't have enough capacity on the rails for transporting all the things, for satisfying the expectations that are expressed toward us. 50% more rail freight until 2030. Is that feasible? Only if we get more capacity. Can we build enough new lines and tracks until then? No, we can't. Money is scarce, land is scarce, and so on. Yeah, that means we find to have we need to find other ways for increasing capacity to trans transport more goods. But we have a lack of productivity as well. Look at the middle. We are mainly on manual processes still in this railway world. We are exchanging on the right side paper instead of digital files. And then we give that to someone who types it into the system. At the same time, we are doing here video conferences on a digital basis. I mean, this does just not match. You know? And that means uh, the, the rail freight needs an improvement in its processes from all this manual stuff moving towards automation. And if you look at those couples here, photos are a little bit older. They look a little bit different now. But um, what you do here is automatic connection of the wagons and especially you do automatic connection of um, energy and data line and why is that important you will see on the next pages this coupler and it looks more like the ones down red uh, down on the right side these coupler heads where we have selected the Scharfenberg type last year as the coupler type head um, for europe this is then of course for coupling and uncoupling and you see here on the upper part of this slide, you see automatic uncoupling, automatic brake testing, train integrity, telematics. These are all the use cases, more or less, that we want to perform with this. And then the duct is the enabler. So the coupling is clear, but then if you have electricity and data, you can also do automatic brake testing. First time in life, more or less, because then you have a connection to the local and then you can do that in minutes and not in hours. Um, telematics but better than today because you don't need only batteries. You can also have the electricity power supply from the local, very important. Train integrity, UTCS level three, this is a very strange animal. You know, today level three moving block operations you cannot do because the, um, the, the end of the train is not known to, in, in today's time, at least not electronically. You see a sign, you see a plate, but you don't have the electronic signal on that. This would change with our local because the last couple would know I am the last. Yeah? And then it's then you can uh, pack the trains better together. And so you have all these other electronic stuff that you need registration of wagon order. You have the basis finally for the automated wagon inspection and so on. Yeah? Wagon component monitoring, everything that you can do with electricity and sensors. And this all in these phases of train preparation during the train run and then shunting train preparation again. And it increases all the things that we want to increase and to improve. And if we do it in the right way, we get more traffic on rail, we get less traffic on road. And this delta is a huge contribution to the EU Green Deal with a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. You know? That means these are the additional things. Here's some very quick slides only on the on the logistics, we may not forget to think about the customer. What does the customer need? Of course, always the same things. These are the classicals since 25 years. Reliability, high shipment, uh, speed, and, and of, of course the costs. And, and then now today, we want to add these digital services. Where is my goods? Where is my data? What is the condition of my goods? And so on. Yeah? And, this you only, and, and when does my train arrive? The, the, the classical question you only can do with the um, a data connection on the, on the dump freight wagon. If you look at some more sophisticated, more side effects, but also this is possible, you have a much better integration into the log logistics chains of the customer, why, with even lights and, and other displays on the data and, and whatever, surveillance of goods and everything which is normal in cars and, and trucks and so on. We can have it then in rail as well. But for this, we need such a coupler because the coupler brings energy and data. And this is now the video. I hope that it will work. I will see. 
and you let me know. Making rail freight more efficient is the key to security. Was that hearable for you? Was it understandable? Can you hear the, 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 the sound? Anna? Yes. Okay, good. And competitive products. Coupling and uncoupling a train is still done manually in Europe. The train operation team has to walk up and down the train several times. When you include shunting, coupling, wagon registration, inspection and brake testing, train preparation takes several hours. Manual processes also pose risks to employee safety. Rail freight also faces a multitude of other challenges, such as including infrastructure capacity challenges, inadequate access and allocation, and lack of interoperability. It therefore does not meet customer needs in today's digital world. But fully digital rail freight operations can solve these problems and even make it possible to reach Europe's climate goals. The digital automatic coupler, or DAC, is a key game changer for European rail freight and an enabler for further automation components. In addition to automatic coupling, the introduction of power and data lines via a digital automatic coupler also allows the automation of train preparation processes, such as the registration of wagon order, the wagons themselves, brake testing, and technical inspection. Complex manual processes are thus completely automated. A freight train is then ready for departure in minutes rather than hours. The digital automatic coupler also makes it possible to safely form longer and heavier trains. This is a crucial step towards greater efficiency and productivity in rail freight transport. Data communication along the entire train enables electronically controlled braking systems which means the speed can be increased and the braking distances shortened. Moreover, a long-awaited train integrity function for freight trains can be realized. With this function, trains can operate more densely on the network using moving block operation under ETPS level three. This leads to a smart capacity increase. Thanks to the power and data supply, Sensors on the wagons can be used, for example, for permanent wagon component monitoring. Performance-based maintenance schemes will become possible for wagon keepers. Digital operations and freight monitoring are the cornerstones for integrating rail freight transport into digital logistics chains. In order to achieve the climate target set in Europe, it is essential to shift freight transport from road to rail. The digital automatic coupler and fully digital rail freight operations are the sector's unique offer to clients and policymakers to achieve sustainable freight transport in the most affordable way. A joint effort across Europe will lead to a joint benefit. Be part of the change. I hope that this was a little bit instructive, maybe better than all the slides and all the words that can explain that. And um, it summarizes why we should need that normally. I will close with the, sorry, with this last slide here. Um, here you see a summary of the effects. I mean, we have the sectoral benefits for rail freight capacity, productivity, quality, especially in the productivity and quality area, you get, you look at the at the red arrow down the competitiveness you really can um, attract new markets and new customers because you have new services and you have better timelines and this is you're just meeting customers and market expectation and this is very good um, this is clearly that these are the improvements needed in the in the sector itself but also societal the the environmental on the right side but think about also about the the, the rail safety we have not really highlighted that but it's really I mean, there are no buffers anymore to get quenched and squeezed into between, you know. And uh, if you think that the investment here is not the biggest investment in the world, but nevertheless, something like 10 billion euros are a huge amount of money. This is also value creation in Europe because most of the parts will be manufactured in Europe, maybe all. 
um, the re retrofit of wagons and locos will be done in all European countries. So this is also a creation of jobs in a certain way. And think that the future jobs will be better workplaces in rail. You cannot attract today's people if, if you just offer grease and dark and mud and night, you know, you also need to offer something digital. And if you then stand on a local and you are operating a freight train and the rest is done automatically and you just have a tablet and you see that this is much more sexy than running around the train, along a train and coupling at night under harsh conditions. And we will also not have these people anymore in the future because uh, generally the um, demographic development will be in such a way that we need to do more with less people, even if we don't want to. That's more or less my part. Here you see the different uh, participants and main actors in this program, besides of all the work package leaders and so on. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I hand back to Anna, because what we now need to learn in the seminar here is that this is a good idea, but this is PowerPoint and video. And you need to have reliable technology for people outside that it really works that we don't have defects with that and so on and for this we have testing for this we have technology development we have the manufacturer's voice to show us what is done to get something in operation which is minimum as reliable as today's buffers for later and then we get all those benefits and with this i think i'm done and i'm happy to take any questions thank you jens and so I think we have a, a question here, Anders. Um, yeah, um, uh, one thing that uh, worries me a little bit is uh, all, all this. You say that the 10 billion or something is not a big sum, but for me, it's a big sum. <laughs> uh, and there are a lot of countries with, with uh, the railroads that are not so rich. So, so how do you think you, we can uh, go through with, with the, the financing of, of this? We have clearly said that this is an offer to European policymakers. If we draw up a plan where we have a technology that works, where we have a migration plan that works, we are close to it. If we have a clear view on how distributing the benefits to, between the different actors, because the wagon keepers will less likely have the benefits than the railway operators, for example. Um, if we have the, the clear understanding of everybody that this is something good, then we have a plan to ask for funding and financing. I mean, just on the basis of own investments from the sector, this will not be able to work. This will not work. And the, um, and the discussion on how much of this money can be provided by other sources than the sector itself is exactly starting now, right now. But it needs to be a reasonable part of the funding. I think this is clear for all business participants um, because the, um, as you said, the sum is huge, the margins are low. And if such a system transformation shall happen, we need some support for everybody in the system that shall participate in that. Yeah. And how do you how do you think we get everyone on board? By conviction. If people think that there's nothing for them because it doesn't work and it's too expensive and we cannot give them some help, then it will be difficult. If it works, if we get all these benefits by, you know, you know these demonstrator trains, Fabian will talk about that later on. If people can see and touch it and you had them in Sweden, we had also the, the, the staff employed there working on this, who was quite enthusiastic about op options and so on, the opportunities. Then we have them on board because then they want to have this better future. And also the railway undertakings who want to serve better their customers and who have nothing which looks like digital today and will look like something modern and new tomorrow. Um, if this conviction is there, and I think we are in this sector, we are already quite convinced that this is the right way to go then everybody will also fight for this and also participate at later, bigger um, transformation and migration plans. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And uh, since you're mentioning tests and demonstrations, I think we should continue and talk about tests. And But thank you very much, Jens, for this uh, great presentation. And, and I uh, stay in the line, yeah. Yes, and then there will probably be more questions at 10. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for now. Okay, so then um, moving on to tests and uh, demonstrations. Uh, it's uh, 
important to secure the functionalities of the DAC and uh, we need therefore the tests and demonstrations but also as uh, Jens mentioned here we need the tests and demonstrations also to show that the technology works and that everybody can get convinced and get on board and want to deploy this new technology and uh, <clears throat> We write and agree on specifications uh, for the DAC uh, according to requirements from operators, railway undertakings, uh, infrastructure managers, etc. around Europe. And these uh, requirements, uh, specifications uh, need to be tested. And once this is done, we can start a deployment. And this uh, is part of the European DAC delivery program as an important uh, aspect. And at first, different uh, DAC types uh, were tested in order to select a future DAC standard for the coupler head. And uh, the Scharfenberg latch type design was selected for the future Europe-wide digital automatic coupling. Um, but uh, now that we have the Scharfenberg latch type uh, design uh, decided, we need to continue to develop the coupler and uh, make further tests. We need to uh, make further specifications and uh, decide on functions for the mechanical parts, but we also need to decide and test the energy and data and communication, as well as uh, the hybrid coupler for the locomotive. And this hybrid uh, coupler will enable the locomotive to um, couple both screw couplers and to the DAC in order to make a smooth uh, deployment. And we will perform and plan tests to ensure that this uh, DAC works on its own, but it also needs to work uh, in operations. And therefore we need uh, demonstrator trains and commercial pilots. And these uh, tests are performed and planned in various consortiums. We have the DAC for EU uh, tests performed in uh, Germany that uh, Fabian will talk about soon. And we have uh, the Swedish winter tests as a part of shift to rail. Both these were important in uh, the decision of the coupler head. Uh, but we also have uh, other consortiums such as Trust5, where there are tests for the DAC level 5, which means automatic uh, coupling and uncoupling. And there will be tests uh, performed in uh, Europe's rail, as we talked about uh, briefly uh, in the last week's seminar. But now I will hand over to Fabian Walczek from Deutsche Bahn, who will tell us about DAC for EU and uh, the tests done and planned there. The floor is yours, Fabian. <laughs> yeah, hi. Thanks, Anna, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yes, perfect. OK, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks also for the invitation and for the for the possibility and chance to speak here. I think um, don't need to say a lot of works for the introduction because Jens mentioned something and you as well. So directly going to jump into the slides. So you should see now the the slides, right? Not yet. Not yet. OK, let's see. Next try. Yes. Better. <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, what I'm going to talk about is um, what we are currently doing for the testing of the duck, and um, Anna also already mentioned that there was somehow a two-phased approach. So we had the um, the type decision for the Scharfenberg type, and we had a competitive tests for um, figuring out which ones uh, of the designs is the best. And now what I'm focusing on today is more on the operational testing. So we have the decided um, design, and now we are trying to figure out what is the, the capability and where are also perhaps um, the challenges that we need to overcome with the suppliers uh, on board. And first of all, some, yeah, some uh, words about the, the organizational background. So the project that we are running 
has been financed by the German Transport Ministry. And we are stuck for EU. It's not just me, Deutsche Bahn, but we are a consortium of um, seven or mainly six uh, players from the uh, railway sector shown here on the upper right. So it's Ameva, GATX, SBB Cargo, Rail Cargo Austria, and VTG. And um, at the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, a schedule so that, that you just get a bigger picture of where we are in the project, because what you can see is that phase one has already been uh, concluded. That has been the testing of the different designs. And as I mentioned, now we are in that phase two for the operational tests. Um, and the project is running until end of this year. So what we are currently trying to do is really still get the the best out of um, the remaining time and really help the discussions in the EDDP as well as in the planning of Europe's rail. And what we are doing is, and that is what I mentioned before, the phase one single coupler test. So where we had competitive tests for all of the couplers, we were on the test side. You can see the pictures here, those two on the left, um, where we varied speed, the wagon types, the load conditions of the wagons, um, and did some really intense tests for really the capability and performance of each of the designs on its own. We went also on the climate chamber. You can see on the right, those two pictures. Um, we not only had the wagons inside of the climate chamber, but what we did as well was to, to climate the wagons so that they would come to a certain temperature, for example, minus 25 degrees. And then we would pull out the wagon and push it into the climate chamber. So we basically did coupling tests inside of the climate chamber. And in the end, that was like a total number of, I don't know, some thousand, 2000, over 2000 individual tests we performed. We gathered the data, we analyzed the data. And in the end, we were able to provide all that into the KO workshops for the EDDP. And then the decision has been made for the coupler design. That is where we are now. So um, what is that we are testing? So we are focusing on those two designs. So the current available um, duck for freight um, that you can get at the market. So that is the, the Delna latch type coupling head in meanwhile, the second generation. And that is the Foyd uh, Scharfenberg coupling head. And you can see on the left, they are obviously installed into the wagons. So, um, and what you can see as well is that it's not just the coupler, but of course we have also um, a lot of instrumentation on board. And you can see in the upper left picture, there's a lot of cables running around because we are always facing the issue, of course. I mean, you need to have the instrumentation, that's for sure. But on the other hand, it's a digital automatic coupler. So you have power and data line. Um, being transmit, transmitted over the electric coupler. So that needs to be connected to the wagon as well. And you can see here on the lower part, um, on the left, you can see that is the bigger uh, box, connection box that we have to, to get all of the um, communication systems installed to connect them to the couplers. And on the right, you can see some, some on the right in the wagon, some parts of the instrumentation. And what we are doing with that is that we are looking at two scenarios. First of all, we are just doing test drives. So basically just going from one side to the other or running in circles at certain spots. So for example, in Switzerland, we ran across the Gotthard Panorama route. Um, and what we would like, would like to see is first of all, what is the behavior of the system, the wagons with the duck equipped while running those passages. And the other thing is, of course, how is the data and power transmitted? Um, and the second part, of course, a big part of the work and the testing is the shunting operations. So what we would like to see is feedback. Um, how does the system behave not only by running, but also by shunting? So what is really the effect of having the coupler on the process? How does it behave? How can it be operated? And how does it also fit into bigger pictures like uh, the operation in the marshalling yard with the hum, for example? And that is where we are trying to, to get a bigger base of experience on, on really the, the impact of topologies of uh, different sites, different countries, different workers, 
different regulations onto the system to really understand how does the duck need to look like? What does it need to, to be capable to do to really fit into our needs? And for example, what I mentioned, um, because that is, of course, uh, something that currently, I mean, we have decided for the mechanical part. Now, a lot of um, the discussions is focusing on, for example, the data communication. And what we are doing is we have three communication systems in parallel. That is the power line system that communicates or modulates the data onto the, um, the power line. Uh, we have the single pair Ethernet. That's a specific newer design of an Ethernet communication that just need a pair of cable. Um, and we have a wireless communication from, from wagon to wagon. And what we are doing is, I mean, we are testing how reliable and uh, what is the performance of the system. We are trying to see how does the communication from one wagon to the other work, but also how am I able to communicate over the complete train and what we are i mean that's somehow coming by 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 nature so if you check how reliable is the system i mean you can also get a first idea of how would a train integrity system look like and how would it behave and how do you do a train initialization because of course all of the modules and all the wagons they um they have IDs, so we can identify where are them in the train, are they available or not, can we communicate with them, and which wagon is it that we are talking to. So that is what we are currently all doing and testing, <clears throat> but as I mentioned, just as a showcase, so nothing of those parts is really yeah, on a, on a market-ready um, state, so that is um, what should be the work for the upcoming month and years um, but we can already see how is the performance and how good is uh, the system uh, fitting to the needs of for example attain and uh, uh, integration and <clears throat> i mean just some more pictures of how does that look like so on the upper left you can see we are um, really pushing wagons over the hump um, and trying to see how does it behave where do you need to uncouple um, which system do you need which system is capable to to really operate in which way um, we also have that's here on the lower left uh, a system that has an electric actuator inside so you are able to uncouple via push, uh, push button that is of course um, I mean, it combines two things. First of all, that's the outlook into the duct type five. And we have a system that can be operated from the side of the wagon. And that is super helpful. Um, and that is also one of the outcomes uh, of the test. So really where does the uncoupling uh, mechanism need to be located and what would be the impact if it is at a certain position? Um, in the middle two pictures you can see at the top and that is uh, often forgotten in the discussions at least that's my experience we are talking about the digital automatic coupler so what is happening here in the in the upper picture that is the current test setup for measuring the data communications as explained as well as the power transmission and on the uh, lower picture you can see a view into one of the designs for the electric coupler so um, that we are really testing how does the system and the communication system behave if they are in the in the environment they are planned to be in so it's not on a laboratory basis or level but we are really trying to figure out how does the system behave as it was planned to look like and on the right and that's also something where um, we always see that the tests from Traffic Bearcat, um, as well as our tests, they're really benefiting from each other because now we can also always try to see, can we compare the results? And we now also had the chance to, to do some winter tests. So um, to, to have some snow and ice on the couplers and see how these systems behave. And that was, of course, quite nice to see because now we already had a first glimpse into the upcoming tests of Traffic Bearcat um, and were able to directly give feedback to the suppliers um, of what work is needed. And 
that's also um, the last slide. Uh, and that is for me of, of bigger importance because the thing is, we are not only talking about testing in Germany, um, neither are we just talking about testing in Austria, Switzerland, but for us, the thing is really to have the biggest and the broadest view possible on the, on the system. So we are currently in discussions with uh, Poland, Czech Republic and France as well to, to really go into their specific sites and see how does the system behave there. Because for us, of course, I mean, what we see, Jens mentioned that, is somehow the train can be seen as an ambassador for the duck. So we can show the system to all of the parties that are interested. Um, but also, of course, we can make use of going to different countries and see what are their specific needs. And then in the end, and that's the overall goal is to all to take all the results and bring them into the discussions in the EDDP, in WP2, WP1, and wherever else it is needed. And that's the end. Thank you, Fabian, for this great overview. And I see that we have some questions already, but uh, we will save them for the Q&A uh, at 10. Um, and now uh, continue in the program. Mm -hmm. So thanks for now. And then we will continue with the presentation from uh, Johan Oman from Delner, who will tell us a bit from a manufacturer's perspective and uh, a bit about the Swedish winter tests. Great. Let's see if I can get this up and running in a way that works. It's going to... All right, thank you, Anna, very, very much for your introduction. So first of all, can you see my screen? Yes. Great, let's go for it. Presentation mode, always interesting. Now it's the wrong screen there, yeah. yeah it's always, <laughs> it's always the wrong screen. <laughs> so just um, quickly uh, recapping, I, this is very, very important what Jens said in the beginning, why are we doing this and just always want to start with this that it's about improving the rates uh, the rail freight sector but also social social environmental aspects which we are running for and we want to improve so down there is a company obviously we we have a solution which we propose and which we are testing deeply at the moment uh, we run from a latch type coupler which then was selected uh, we're modular based we have always been that as a company. Obviously, a lot of other benefits, low LCC, easy to maintain and easy to install. And let's see, why did we come to this level or where did we where did we start and where are we now and where we're we going is a little bit what I'm going to talk about and how does the testing play into this. So we are the generation three today. Uh, generation one is the one which uh, we started with. And what we're always trying to do is look at this NASA scale of technical readiness levels. So basically, we're doing testing is to show and try to push us through this technical readiness level six and seven. That's what we can do, maybe push it eight if we're lucky at these tests. And to try to simulate uh, a real type of environment as much as possible. And this is creates uh, a very interesting iterative process. Obviously, we start with customer requirements. Um, we have the must-haves and the satisfiers. Uh, we have a number of interdependencies when it comes to general conditions, commercial requirements, process-related, customer-specific requirements, and then technical product-related re re requirements. And there always seems to be a balance between the technical requirements and the commercial requirements. Uh, no one wants to pay more than they want for it, but everyone wants to put a man on the moon at zero cost. So it's finding this balance. Before I go further on, I just show you some of the major features uh, so you understand a little bit what I'm talking about. Uh, the electrical coupler does the electrical and digital connections. We have the latch type with a mechanical coupler head which does the mechanical coupling. And then we have the draft gear, which handles energy absorptions. Uh, and then due to pure physics, uh, you need some support. Otherwise this would dip down onto the track. Well, actually it won't, but it, it helps it keep it stable and centered. 
So when we started looking at this 2018, 2019, there was a pretty rudimentary requirement, uh, 154 different technical requirements is what I got it to. Things like stepping plates, UIC 530-1 for A compatible, not 6A compatible, coupling and curves, snow and ice based on the, the technical reports uh, or the era, digital signals, pneumatic coupling, electric coupling, it should be automatic. And basically, there was no target cost, but this is one of those hidden requirements. Basically, um, it should be as low cost and robust as possible. So what did we do as a company? Uh, we started by looking at our different boxes, which we have, our modular boxes, to see what did we have. And this is not the electrical coupler we used. We actually used one which has been running on other systems. Uh, so we had a proof of concept. We knew this would actually work. It worked in the field pretty well. We took and based our coupler head design on a latch type coupler, which has a long history of working on the passenger side of rail traffic, but also robust, easy to use. And if we're looking at to create electrical and digital coupler, uh, coupling in a robust fashion, it's probably the best solution. And then we went into our box of draw gears and shanks. And actually this is a design which is used commonly by Denner on um, passenger traffic for, for another continent, so the European continent. Uh, it's um, basically what we do is we come to this level of where we have a design a concept which is ready we have it in our computer systems we run it around we turn it we do some basic calculations our next step is basically that we we do prototypes uh, but also this before we do prototypes we do some serious simulations to create to ensure that we actually have all the structural integrities we need we do safety simulations to say we we take the different requirements when it comes to energy systems and we do uh, simulations of crashes and potential uh, other safety scenarios and then we do reliability assessment based on the design we have so it has to be reliable it has to be safe this is going to be in a rail environment uh, it, and it shouldn't fail so we do all those assessments once we have a prototype, we obviously do a first assembly and inspection and we do a full type test based on our best knowledge. We have a procedure we usually agree with uh, the customer. And we get up to somewhere around a technical readiness level, which shows that we, we in a lab or in a closed environment actually can manage to do most of the performances or the performances required in this 174 requirements. What happens next? Next is the most important thing is where we get into the testing is where we, we put it uh, into the real environment. So this is the first time we actually put these couplers on wagons. You can see the nice design with the step plates and it's nice and black. Uh, and this is what it looked like in the workshop in, I think this was in Eskistun actually. And great. Works, we're happy we can move on. So let's see. All right. So what were the major takeaways from, from the testing? So in generally the functionality was great. We we managed to do most of the tests uh, according to what we wanted. It the forces were okay, it coupled uh, in most scenarios. There are obviously some tweaks and things we which were not completely perfect, but in general. Uh, pretty good, and especially in this in a new environment. Uh, what we did have concerns about was, and to be honest, derailment and also some medications of ice and snow. So what, what happens then? What happens then is that we actually take uh, the requirements. We come into 67 well-defined requirements, which are the basic ass assessment, which uh, Fabian uh, talked about. We also see that the timeline for the general implementation and selection uh, is moved on. A little bit. Um, we have this derailment requirement, which becomes very clear. We have a new pin configurations coming to electrical bit, and we have discussions ongoing about buff position. So we take this back, we do a loop, and then we produce a generation two. So first generation two is, I wouldn't say completely ready for use, but it's becoming a, a very robust and reliable solution. Uh, which has closed most of the first preliminary 
problems. And this is a little bit of a lean development process, which a lot of people learn at school that we, we iterate, try to iterate fast to try to get as close as possible to, to a solution. So uh, UIC, uh, 530 pocket, integratable, uh, Angular uh, movements, according to the specification, it's derailment optimized is what we call it. So it should be able to stand derailment. I think at the test later on, which we did, it did not show that we met the 500, but we're well above uh, the 400, 450 level, which is good. It's lubricant free. And there is a good mechanical stroke indicator, which is also one of those requirements, which, which comes in. Uh, obviously, the coupler head, then uh, it's a latch type. It's beefed up a bit to meet some more of the requirements to have a bit of safety margin. And we meet the gathering range requirements uh, within the specification. So let's look at the installation quickly then. Um, so that we, everyone sees what the installation looks like. So back plates, we have an expanding system, which means there's a leeway in the installation space. Uh, it's four, eight bolts, and basically from that point on, you're rock and roll, you're ready to go. The support and centering device. Uh, and then you put in uh, your copper shank and head and using a pin, which is bottom mounted. This pin on the bottom mounted actually means that you, it's a very standardized, easy interface to use to extract and retract and put back uh, the copper if you want to do that later. So let's see. So spaces look like this. Um, and originally, in the first in generation two, you actually weld this. And, and this is one of those things we noticed. And this is part of testing is to install these things. We see that the installation time to do this pre-installation is what took most time. To actually do the installation once you've done the pre-work is about 30 minutes. So it's pretty quick to install. That's to say you have lifted up your wagon. All right, so this moves into, this is what it looks like uh, in, in a workshop where they installed generation two. Uh, we have the selection of the latch type, which Fabian told us about uh, 21st of September, uh, 2021. Uh, these are also the type of testing we do where, where you, you dislodge uh, the copper. This is a prototype of a new front face, which we're testing to see that it works, uh, different electrical couplers set up. And this was done together with Swedish testing, and this was last week. It wasn't as cold as we wanted, but we did have a great opportunity to test uh, these, these conditions. So what we do, I say, and a bit cocky, that the, great, the functionality is great. Um, obviously, areas of concern, solar ice and snow, the installation, and then the buff position is something that comes up. And the buff position, is something that comes as an effect of testing and showing and demonstrating. And more people get into it and say, well, we need these features in hands to be able to work and operate the way we want. So obviously a new set of requirements. We also see that the implementation time here starts to, to run. And this is when we will get the money from the European Union or there is a decision to, to actually go for this. But some of the more important things, better installation, we have a BP valve, one and a quarter inch, but we get new requirements starting to come into this. A 200 millimeter build height, uh, we have new electrical requirements coming in. And this actually means that we probably will have to deep, deep dive. But if we take some of the ones which uh, were very clear when we designed what we call generation three. And generation three for us has been very, very much focused on uh, the, the draw gear to make this. So you see curved surfaces, uh, installation, which does not require welding. So this theoretically, we should be able to install in 30 to 45 minutes. Hopefully we can do a test together with Fabian in a few weeks. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that there are no more issues uh, with um, COVID and so on and, and deliveries through Russia. Um, Another feature, uh, modifications being done to the front plates here to try to get around the problems and issues with snow and ice. So this is one version we have. I think we tested three different versions with front plates together with the Swedish testing last week to ensure that we uh, trying to improve the snow and ice uh, situation to try to find an optimal what is good and what is bad. Weight decrease, a great weight decrease of about 100 kilos. This is obviously very important for the complete total owner, cost of ownership. 
um, the pivot pins and so on are revised. There's a lot of improvements coming in. And all these improvements come as feedbacks from the testing of both the deck for Europe, but also from the Swedish winter testing, which is a great complement when it comes to testing slightly different features. Obviously, uh, where are we today? 22, uh, one of the more important things is this pre-installation. I'll show you a little bit what that is. Uh, the big concern for us at the moment is the 200 millimeter build height requirement, which has, was a possible discussion, which actually leads has led us to go down very, very deep into the basic technology and research different types of solutions uh, to try to find some way to, to meet this. But we also see that the implementation line here goes, I don't know if it's 25 or 26, but we do see that the implementation timeline is also going, which means that we, we have, I wouldn't say a bigger time, but the reason, one reason for this is obviously to try to get more people involved and to try to sell this in, just like Jens explained, so that more people know what is coming and to give their feedback so that we have a solution that fits and is tailored to as many needs as possible. Uh, this pre-installation basically means you can install a, a draft gear into your existing wagon, retain the buffers, and then install a hook, which means that by removing a front plate, you can then put in using the center pin, you can actually uh, come to the point where you have a DAC ready product or you have a DAC installed into your wagon. So this thing about the future, uh, great Swedish design working here. Um, if you look at the 200 millimeter height requirement, and this is what I mean about going back really far back into your design process, the, the tests show that basically 200 millimeter build height, and here we have nearly uh, we have 385, it's quite far away from the 200 millimeter build height. It means that you have to reconfigure the design in such a way that you, in our suggestion then to move it to the bottom. There are other suggestions by other suppliers to use areas around here to do this. But it, this shows that testing and exposing it to different people and different users actually has given us user cases which might need complete redesign and re-engineering of certain parts. So will this need complete new testing? Yeah, probably some new testing. Is this the way we will go? I don't know. I think that is still an open discussion, but as long as we have all the requirements needed, we might have to re-engineer larger parts of this whole design. Uh, the good thing is everything behind the coupler head is still the same. And we still have the same principles within the coupler head. So it's still the latching type. It's just the gathering principles, which are different. So for me, these are the heroes, uh, Hans doing the testing in Sweden, and these are my engineering team who do the testing and also have done a lot of the designs uh, which you see and which are shown. And this is what it looks like when you know, you're, you're at a yard and you're changing coupler heads, uh, redoing this. I think this switch of coupler heads took us four coupler heads in about an hour. So it's pretty quick to switch heads, which gives us an opportunity to try different designs. So together with the Swedish testing team, I think we tested four different copper designs uh, to try to find out an optimum and try to meet the requirements. And here you see an example of a machined copper head, which with the grooves to try to look at, see if how uh, snow and ice dissipation can, can be improved. Uh, and this is then led from generation one, two, three, and let's see where generation four or five will go. But I think that this is still an ongoing story until we, we decide or try to find an optimum, which is a good compromise between the requirements, needs, and obviously cost, robustness, life cycle costs, and all these other words you can use to describe the whole project. So thank you much, very much for your attention. Thank you, Yuan for a very great presentation and uh, yeah we have some questions uh, for you one as well but uh, we will take them uh, in the q a and uh, now we will continue to uh, anders and uh, björn yes. who, who will tell us a little bit how we can introduce the digital automatic coupler in sweden and norway yeah yeah, I can. Um, uh, I think it's uh, hello. Is Bjorn there, for instance? Uh, 
Yes, hello, Bjorn. Uh, I just want to show uh, two pictures uh, about one thing that uh, has been worked very, uh, many have been thinking about and still is uh, planning and thinking about is the, how to do the migration. Uh, I just want to show two, two pictures that uh, uh, is one idea and it's not written in stone, it could be uh, done in other way. But many, many people say that uh, if we are going to change from, from screw couple to digital couples, we have to do it fast because once you have sh changed one wagon, you cannot uh, couple uh, an automatic coupling with the screw couple. So, so you have to uh, there is logistical problems as soon as you start this uh, migration. One thing uh, we have been discussing in, in a pro project called Accelerate is that uh, you start with um, uh, what's inside the uh, damping equipment, uh, the draw gear, uh, and uh, to install that uh, beforehand, you, you can start with that. And th that requires that you lift the wagon in a workshop. So, so but the couple had, as, as we saw and as uh, Johan told, could be uh, switched uh, outside. And don't, you don't need a, a workshop for that. So, uh, can you? Yeah, thank you. So, and the, the other ones you have done that, uh, this could be. Uh, um, thing that you start with to couple two wagons with uh, automatic couplers uh, and two wagons and uh, until you have half of the wagons fleet is uh, coupled and then you uh, <coughs> you just switch them at the other dire direction looks very easy but maybe it's <laughs> that is a logistical problem as well but it can be done and uh, <coughs> then you can continue with uh, to uh, to install uh, the couplers, uh, so that may uh, just to to uh, you can uh, think about uh, own ideas of how to do the migration and uh, Bjorn, uh, I switch to you. How how are you thinking and how are you doing in Norway? Uh, I I'm not in Norway at the moment, but <laughs> I'm abroad for the first time. Sorry, yeah. I couldn't be in Gothenburg. I'm in Ora at the moment. I'm going to have two meetings uh, here later. Uh, but uh, I think one issue which we haven't discussed much is all the benefits or many of the benefits which was which we talked about earlier requires uh, quite a lot of cabling, electric cabling in the wagon. Yeah. And at least for the Norwegian market, you see that uh, for the intermodal trends, all operators use very, very similar or exactly similar or like wagons. So I think it's very important to, uh, we have to cooperate more than we usually do in the runway to do this across between wagon owner, rail operators uh, and competitors. Because uh, to do this, we must in some way stop to be competitors and cooperate. Yeah. Uh, because uh, unless everybody or anybody that isn't on board won't get the benefits and will be um, uh, I'm going to say that uh, left behind. Yes. Uh, so uh, there is uh, the cabling or uh, the the part behind the coupler. You, you, but you and you and talked about the coupler and how that could be done. But uh, the items behind the couplers is important, and uh, it could be beneficial to use the ten bar. Um, especially if you talk about EP brakes and so on. And then you need not only electrical cabling, but also possible pneumatic cabling. This is easy on a 
new wagon, it's much more difficult than an old wagon. Uh, and I think that you must talk, think about things like uh, having uh, pre-made cabling that is um, that everything is made uh, on a on a jig and is just mounted on the wagon in a fairly short time in a in a pre-decided manner. Uh, one okay. benefit, but one benefit in railways, of course, that or in freight railways that. The wagon series are fairly big, so if you make a, a jig, you could uh, use it for many wagons. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so that's the end of all the presentations. Yes. And um, now we will continue to the Q&A session. So I will ask all the presenters to switch on their cameras again. And we have, firstly, we have uh, a question to uh, Yuan. And it's, uh, what would it mean for the safety to have a 400 volt AC instead of 110 DC power line? So this is beyond the 120 volt limit of IEC. And does this increase required yearly safety checks in workshops? What yeah, do you think? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an electrical expert. I think that a lot of the discussions at the moment are concerning about how do we secure that the, the electrical coupler actually, or that, that front plate is actually closed and how it's non-conductive in case of an accident. So I think that's one of the, mo one of the concerns. I don't know if it'll mean more checks. I think the, the wagons are in for checks every 12 months anyway. Maybe it's a, just a quick check. Um, I've not heard anything about maintenance. It's more about the safety of what happens when you're standing still. OK, thank you. Um, I, I did can, you have a I comment? Can, yeah, just a short comment that about uh, all, all this uh, with the electrical and data that, uh, is uh, is new to the uh, workshops for freight uh, wagons because uh, we don't have that today. So uh, there will be a need for for uh, competence in the workshops uh, in the future. Yes, and uh, then we had a questions also to uh, Anders and Björn, but uh, perhaps uh, the others could also help and. It's about the requirements um, between the distance between uh, the sill to end. I don't know if that's uh, the translations, but uh, between the coupled cars. Um, we want a short distance. It's important to maximize the train length, uh, to utilize the capacity and to minimize aerodynamic turbulence, etc. cetera. Um, has this been considered? We had uh, th that uh, talk from the beginning when I started working with uh, digital couplers in 2014. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I must uh, admit that I don't know how the Schaffenberg type is. But uh, in, in new wagons, you can start uh, constructing the wagons so that you minimize the, 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 the area between the wagons. But, but uh, for old wagons, I think that's more difficult. Perhaps uh, Jens, I yeah, may, don't know if I you quickly, wanted to add something. Yeah, may I quickly jump in here, yeah, thanks on that. Um, you know, the, the, the distance between the wagons can, of course, over time be optimized. You just need to make sure that if you are in narrow curves, you still need to be able to couple the wagons. And that means yeah. you cannot yeah. touch the borders of the wagons to each other, so that there are some limits somehow. Yeah? I think at the moment, Johan and Fabian help me, but the, the but but the level of coupling is more or less the, the same level or the same surface. The plane has been kept the same. And the, the, the thing, there's, there's a balance between there are some wagon keepers who want the exact distance because they have unloading docks, which For have example, a certain distance. This is one thing. Because one of the original things we discussed uh, 2018 would be that should we shorten them? Because theoretically, we could shorten maybe the distance by 200 millimeters on each side. Yeah. But the comment was that, well, then unloading docks will not work. So it, we get 
get into other problems, which is one reason that we're going to be you know, we cannot do too many changes to infrastructure because that is more expensive than doing the DAC exchange. But just a comment on the DAC, the DAC cost of the DAC exchange, it's 30 euros per tax paying European citizen one time payoff. That's what we're talking about. Are you willing to pay 30 euros, Jens? Yes, you are. Yes, and especially I always say that for 10 billion euros you, in Germany, you get one nearly functioning airport. Nearly functioning, yes. Nearly functioning airport. <laughs> <laughs> and that means 10 billion for all over Europe for one change system overall is maybe not that bad investment, right? So it's not, it's not a huge <laughs> amount of money. Yeah. In, in the tech context of the European budget, it's, it's a very small. It's not. Sorry, just yeah. a side, side comment. Fully, fully correct. Yeah, but I guess that's uh, one of the challenges that we have to consider what is the infrastructure that we have to adapt uh, to and uh, what possi possibilities do we want to create for the future uh, that's always an interesting topic to discuss and uh, <clears throat> but there's another question for uh, fabian and it's about the wireless communication uh, inside the coupler head is that evaluated in the tests um no we are not testing the wireless inside of the coupler head and that's mainly due to um, yeah, as Johan mentioned, the involvement of the generations, also of the electric coupler. So, so far, the electric coupler is already quite full because we are testing all of the communication systems in parallel. And there is no off the shelf system that you could directly take and integrate into the electric coupler head to have a really functioning wireless communication inside of the coupler heads. So what we are doing is we are mimicking from one wagon to the other. So that is um, that we have a wireless communication in parallel to the ones inside of the coupler. But um, this idea of integrating it directly to the coupler head has been actually newer than our um, time to, to get the electric coupler heads and um, to install them and to um, yeah, connect them to the systems. So we are not currently testing that. Yes, thank you. And uh, another question for uh, Johan, and it's about why is it important to test in the harsh winter conditions? I mean, th there is there's a principal decision taken that we should do everything at T1. But if you look at the Swedish, Norwegian and Finnish regulations, I think the requirement is T2. So whatever we test, even if we design this for T1, we have to have a T2 type of, of uh, compatibility. What I say, the interesting thing is maybe not so much the, the, the purely physical bits. Uh, I think those were pretty well within. It's things like how does, uh, you know, burn out, uh, I mean, the, the ice build up, how is that influenced by turbulence? Um, and, and probably one, one thing we've been looking at is how do we design the electrical coupler to, to minimize turbulence? Uh, so you get different types of buildups also based on the braking patterns we have and, and all these things you have to do in real life now what i might be missing is, is sort of a reference what would a reference to what it is like today so if you have a train running with the docks you should maybe have a few wagons without the docks to compare how much build up is it versus the existing and all but this is things we're discussing a little bit discussing within the flagship area five uh, when we get there yeah, I, 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 maybe he is it. So I think the ice build up, um, not so much concerned about the, the coupling with ice. I think that's solvable. It has been solvable. So, but if I may add here, we don't, you know, we you don't want to take in trains to the ice. And Jens, you're muted. That's... Yes, um, thank you. And Jens, what you, you want to add something? Is it, am so I here? Here, Jens. No, no, better. Yeah. Here, here something I don't know what um, the uh, if, if I may add there are four enemies of the railway do you know them it's spring summer autumn and can winter. Hear you, Jens. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you yes can you hear me we, no, yes yes we, we hear you but it's just one. strange it's you one who switched your sound off. No? <laughs> no, you can, can, you can uh, continue, yes. Okay, thank you. So the four enemies of the railways, spring, 
autumn, uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. That means um, normally under, under perfect conditions, you can always do what you want. Then everything is working. It always is when humidity, cold, too hot, sand, ice, and so on. And if you want to have a system functioning like today's buffer and, and these hooks, which are so simple, mm. even under greasy conditions and in the night and in Finland somewhere, you know, then you also have to make that stuff work in the same way because what we don't want to have in the end is a coupler system where we always need mobile teams to get our 200 kilometers somewhere into the forest to uncouple wagons manually. You know, this is not the aim of the whole exercise here. So it must work because if not coming back to your basic questions, how can we convince people? Yeah, if it works properly, of course. Yeah, <laughs> this, this also, of course, yeah, um, contains working in, uh, autumn, summer, <laughs> spring, winter, and so on. Yeah. Good. Definitely, and, you're right. And and also another uh, aspect is uh, for you, Bjorn. Norway, it's it's outside EU, but uh, how will you be able to align with the the rest of EU? Uh, uh, the, we follow our. A little later due to all the bureaucracy, but we, we usually follow all the regulations that, uh, that Europe puts in, in, in place. And uh, we are very early discussing the financial part of this uh, between us and the Department of Transportation and Communication. Uh, so, um, there shouldn't be, other than possibly financing, there shouldn't be any big differences between Norway and the, and the European Union. Uh, the formal regulations will probably be one year later. They usually are because uh, uh, the formal bureaucracy is that we have to do some kind of negotiation between us and EU before it is, uh, and then an agreement between Norway and EU uh, for the regulations, and then they formally have to be taken into Norwegian law. But, but mm. in essence, it doesn't matter, but because if there is no, ob no obvious objections, we start to implement before the regulation is in force. So that, that sounds good. I think we will be able to manage this in the whole Europe then. Uh, I would like to continue discuss the discussion here, but I see that the, it's already a uh, quarter past. Uh, uh, Jens, uh, you want to say a final short uh, word? Uh, yeah, please, something to, to Björn. He mentioned two very important points, and one is connecting to what Johan has shown. Um, Björn, you said cooperation of all actors. Yeah. And this is so crucial. I think Anders meant the same in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. How can we implement that all? And it's about the functioning. It's about the distribution of the benefits. Yeah, I shortly touched upon this. I think you mentioned it as well, because railway undertakings have different benefits than wagon keepers. But maybe others are the ones to pay for the couplers. So who needs, who receives funding and financing and who will have the benefits and making this functioning without too big administrative hurdles, because that in the end is then a next nightmare that we don't want to have. But this cooperation, you know, this comes now to my next point. Please don't misunderstand me. I don't like war pictures, but here we are talking with the migration of such a coupler system, even if it's just a coupler, but it's a coupler on 450,000 wagons, which are maybe the relevant fleet for that all over Europe. That means we are more talking about the logistical challenge of an operation overlord than of just converting maybe one workshop in, with, with some tools or so, you know? That means we need to cooperate. We have block trains, we have intermodal trains, we have this huge part of the non-unmixable single wagon load and friends traffic. And here we have many actors in. We have not only one big railway undertaking per country, we have many private liberalized and so on. We have the wagon keepers, we have so many stake, hundreds of stakeholders and the workshops to be coordinated. And that will be the real challenge. And here we need really to find a good way of working together. And this will be a fantastic exercise once this is done. And I think we have never seen such a challenge before in European rail even, yeah? And this leads now to the second point that you are making and with, with your jig and installation and also what Johan said. 
um, it is so important to come down with the installation time for the for the different uh, things. Each each hour you save, you save four hundred fifty thousand working hours all over Europe. Yeah, and if you can install cables with jigs or whatever prefabricated, and Johan, you know that we were talking about duck readiness. You have shown that you know installation into the just putting out the pin, getting the, 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 the screw clapper head, I mean, or the, the, the hook out, getting the duck head in, pin and out. This is what we need for all kinds of technology. This is, uh, we need to, to design this technology for fastest retrofitting everywhere. Also the, the, the electronic parts. And this is something we, I think we are not yet at the end of the, of the development. Maybe we have just even started it. But we cannot afford 50 hours of installation of technology into one wagon, then we are dead. Yeah? And we need to find ways to, to lower that. But I'm certain we will get it done because the challenge is there. This just as a final remark, because these are the main challenges for me also for the implementation, cooperation and make it fit. Okay. Thank you. I think that's summarized the challenges ahead. Um, Bjorn, did you want to say something, final comment on that? Yes, it's actually that it is. It's a final comment on that. If we need motivation for coping with this big challenge, I urge you to look into the, um, or, or Google, the gate change day in the US yeah. for, in, 18, in 1886. <laughs> this is a very good image in what, what, what actually might be done if you, if you really, really, really want to do it. Fully agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. For thank you <laughs> thank you for those words uh, and, uh, and thank you we, we for will share uh, the link uh, Bjorn. send it to us and i will also i'll, tr okay. I'll try to find it and yeah. send it <laughs> thank you <laughs> great <laughs> okay thank you to all the presenters and for this uh, discuss discussion um, i would like to continue as i said but the time has run out, but uh, and thank you for all the attend attendees uh, listening. And uh, if you missed the seminar, there will, the recordings will be on our websites and uh, you will be able to catch up there. So thank you and bye for this time. Thanks for the invitation. Bye bye. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.